Well, welcome back. I think we're ready to continue to discuss the organization of upper motor neurons and focus on the premotor cortex. So my learning objective for you is that I want you to be able to discuss the organization of the premotor cortex and its contributions to the control of volitional movement. So I'll remind you again that the premotor cortex is a region of the posterior frontal lobe that uh, sits just in front of the precentral gyrus. Uh, it might include a bit of the anterior bank of the precentral gyrus, but it extends into the posterior part of the superior, middle, and inferior frontal gyri. And it also extends onto the midline of the hemisphere. Uh, here, for example, is our paracentral lobule, so this is where we would find our primary motor cortex, and then just anterior to it, in the medial bank of the superior frontal sulcus, and then in the um, banks of the cingulate sulcus, including the cingulate gyrus itself, uh, we find a medial extension of that premotor cortex. Illustrated here in this slide is the distribution of the premotor cortex in a rhesus macaque brain where the details of organization are much more clear at least at this stage in our understanding so where we find uh, this more orangish color that's our premotor cortex now there has been a fairly radical change in our thinking about the premotor cortex in recent years um, some time ago we imagined some kind of hierarchical organization where the premotor cortex was primarily involved in planning movement, but the actual execution of the movement required signals that were derived from the primary motor cortex. So it was thought that the premotor cortex existed at a higher plane in some kind of hierarchy for motor control. Well, those concepts are, are beginning to unravel as we have a greater appreciation for what's actually encoded in the motor cortex. But we also uh, understand much better now that the premotor cortex itself gives rise to descending projections to lower motor neurons. So the argument for premotor cortex being conceptualized as a higher plane for motor control seems to be losing some of its attraction. I think the concept that is uh, becoming uh, much more viable and frankly much more interesting and, and productive for understanding upper motor systems is the notion that this premotor cortex actually comprises a mosaic of areas that have some kind of modular organization reflecting the encoding of ethologically important motor behaviors. Now, it is helpful to find some way to simplify our understanding of this mosaic, and I would suggest a means of simplifying would be to recognize a medial part of our premotor cortical mosaic and a lateral part. Where exactly one would make that division is uh, not so clear, but perhaps one would, would roughly subdivide this premotor cortex at about the location of the superior frontal sulcus. So our medial division of the premotor cortex corresponds to what in the older literature was uh, described as a supplementary motor area. So for those of you that are looking at other resources uh, in support of your learning, you, you may run into that phrase, supplementary motor cortex. It certainly is still used in both clinical and scientific discussion. But for our purposes, we'll simply consider that supplementary motor cortex or SMA for short, a division that is localized here to the medial part of the premotor cortex. Now included in that medial part of the premotor cortex is uh, a very interesting set of regions here in the banks of the cingulate sulcus that uh, we'll spend just a little bit of time talking about. They seem to be involved in the expression of emotional behavior out on the dorsal lateral convexity of the hemisphere, we see other uh, regions of this medial premotor cortex that are concerned with organizing bimanual activities. And this implies that they have a rich set of colossal connections uh, as they do. Uh, so bimanual coordination seems to be a function of this premotor cortex.
There is also a division of this medial premotor cortex that is especially concerned with governing voluntary psychotic eye movements. We call this region the frontal eye field. And this is a part of the premotor cortex that helps to orient our attention, and therefore what we're looking, uh, across the midline to some location in the contralateral visual hemifield. Now, generally speaking, these medial parts of the premotor cortex seem to be especially involved with organizing movements that are self-initiated, movements that are not necessarily triggered or directed by sensory cues. One example of what I mean by this in the frontal eye field would be turning our gaze to some object in the contralateral part of the visual field that we intend to look at. Perhaps there's a clock over to your right and you want to look towards your right to see what time it is. Uh, so there wasn't necessarily an emergent stimulus that just grabbed our attention. Uh, rather, there was an intentionality about the shift of gaze. And that intentionality was self-initiated. Now contrast that, if you will recall, to the role of the superior colliculus in organizing eye movements. If you're outside and a bolt of lightning happened to strike somewhere off in the distance to one side, you may very well make a reflexive movement of eyes and head posture in order to see that bolt of lightning while it persists. Well, that is a reflexive saccade that's coordinated at the subcortical level through circuitry that involves the retina sending signals to the superior colliculus and then the colliculus sending output that governs the movements of the eyes and the muscles that orient our head and our neck. We call that a reflexive saccade. Uh, that wasn't self-initiated in the same sense as the desire to see what time it is. So now let's turn our attention to the lateral parts of the premotor cortex. Here what we find is a mosaic of areas that are involved in organizing movements that are often guided by sensory information, or at least with the interactions uh, that we might have with the world around us. And that would include social interactions as well. For example, we find areas that uh, exist here in the inferior part of this premotor cortex that are especially concerned with social communication. Now, for us in the human brain, uh, we can recognize one region that is of great interest, and it's found in the posterior part of the inferior frontal gyrus. And this is a region that goes by the name Broca's area. So Broca's area is part of this premotor cortex that organizes the vocal motor apparatus for the production of speech. There are very likely uh, nearby uh, regions, uh, also part of this premotor mosaic, that is involved in the production of language in written form, either through the act of writing with a writing implement, or of course now we can touch on keyboards and touch screens. And that is a motor act that is involved in communicating thought and semantic content uh, through symbolic representation. And that seems to be one function of these more lateral and inferior divisions of this premotor mosaic. Also in this same region of the premotor cortex, we have some really fascinating neurons that have captured worldwide attention in recent years. These are neurons that are concerned not just with the expression of movement that we make with our own body, but also encoding the intentions of movements that we see other individuals perform. And because of this mirror-like capacity of encoding our own movements and observed movements, such neurons with this behavior are called mirror motor neurons. Mirror motor neurons were discovered quite accidentally when recordings were being made in this lateral premotor cortex uh, while monkeys were engaged in visually guided reaching behaviors to pick up a small object. And what was observed is that when the monkey simply sat passively while the experimenters reloaded the apparatus by executing a very similar type of uh, hand movement, the neurons in the premotor cortex of the monkey's brain responded at the sight of 
of the human hand performing the very similar act that the monkey himself was about to execute. This is illustrated here in this figure from our textbook. Uh, what we find is a recording from one such neuron in the lateral part of the premotor cortex and we're looking at raster plots such as what we saw previously so each row is an individual trial and each little tick mark represents an action potential. What was uh, really surprising at the time was that the very same neuron was seen to increase its firing rate when a very similar act was observed in a different agent, in this case the hand of the experimenter. Well, as you might imagine this was a, a really shocking discovery uh, that neurons in the motor cortex might represent movement observed in another person. So quite a lot of work has gone on in the last two decades or so to really explore the encoding of movement and tension that is observed here in this lateral premotor cortex. Uh, what was discovered is that these neurons uh, seem to care about the agent itself. Uh, if a tool is used, for example, to perform a particular movement goal, then this neuron um, might not be concerned with that particular behavior. In this example, if a food pellet is retrieved with a pair of pliers, uh, this neuron doesn't seem to fire. Um, whereas the natural movement that the monkey makes or is observed by a human hand will elicit a robust set of discharges in this premotor neuron. Uh, very interestingly, if the monkey is prevented from actually observing the contact of the hand with the food pellet, uh, that is the consummation of the motor act, uh, by occluding that view with some kind of a screen, we still see activation of this so-called mirror motor neuron in the lateral premotor cortex. It's as if what this neuron is encoding is the goal of the behavior or the intention of the behavior, which in this case is executing a precision grip to retrieve a pellet. Even when that act is not observed, there's still activity in this premotor neuron. So the discovery of these mirror motor neurons has really led to, I think, a really remarkable hypothesis. And that is that the lateral part of the premotor cortex is involved in encoding the intention of movement. And that movement intention might provide a foundation for social cognition. Because these neurons are concerned not just with my intentions, but also with your intentions. When we observe the activities of others, we might actually represent that behavior within our motor system, and that might give us a sort of knowledge or understanding of the intention of that motor act. And this is a very active and frankly quite controversial domain of cognitive neuroscience at the moment, so we don't quite know how this is going to all play out. But I do suspect that this is an important discovery that is going to inform our understanding of social cognition, perhaps even the basis for disorders that lead to impairments in social cognition, uh, such as some developmental disorders that result in the autism spectrum of disorders. This also provides some intriguing possibilities for intervention. If in such neurodevelopmental disorders of cognition there may be an underlying problem with the motor system, then perhaps there is a movement-based intervention that might help to restructure connections in this part of the brain that could produce some functional benefit to the patient. Well, that's total speculation on my part at this point, but I think it's an interesting idea that's worthy of some study.